So why did we invent the unit of molarity or the conversion factor of molarity? To simplify. So you could understand. So we can understand, simplify, okay, but what? So we're able to convert certain measurements to whenever we find like problems with chemistry like if we solve these You could take large numbers and make them smaller. That would be moles to atoms, not molarity. Molarity is not going to take large numbers and make them smaller. They're actually usually keeping them numerically about the same. Why use molarity? So Lauren's suggestion is so that we can do oh, conversions. Yeah. Right? So really, that's why we want molarity, so that we can do more conversions. You guys are like, yeah, give me more conversions. I just want more. Make me convert more things. Right? Possible conversions is starting to get at a better idea. The reason we have conversions is not because I want to convert things. Okay. That's not the goal. The goal is we have an experiment. I can just talk to myself and I can just advance this. If we take a look at the reaction above, silver bromide is worth $2,000 per milligram. What, I, I'm confused. What's that response about? Why are you going? Oh, wow, that's a big deal. What? Milligrams are small, right? So why is that a big deal? A lot of money for a small amount of material. So one of the things we might want to do would be to make that substance, right? Yeah. Right? To make that substance, what do I have to do? You have to understand how to make that substance. I could use a chemical equation. What does that chemical equation set me up with? The recipe to make that substance, right? Correct. Right? So cool, I could go through and just start making it. Right? But maybe I want an idea of how much money I could possibly make. Right? So I might try and plan ahead that I would need, I don't know, 20 grams of aluminum bromide and 10 grams of silver nitrate for this to work. Okay? So I'd want to be able to plan out, this is how much money I'm going to have. So that you could go talk to somebody that's going to buy your silver bromide and be like, I'm going to come back with 20 grams of this. Make me a millionaire. Is that true? Find your money. No, I completely made that. <laughs> Find the money somewhere so that when I get you this, you can pay me that amount. We have to come up with that financial system. There has to be some kind of planning behind it. So if there's a large monetary gain to come out of this, I want to be able to plan ahead for all the millions I'm going to be making out of this. So I want to come up with that system. Right? How could I measure the amount of product that I'm going to make? Molarity. Okay. Molarity. There's an interesting idea. That unit's on the screen. Might as well. What does molarity measure? Uh, the amount of a substance dissolved in a solution. Is silver bromide going to be measured via molarity? Why not? It's a solid. It, by definition, is not dissolved in a solution. That's why it's a solid. That's why we have that phase there. Molarity is a horrible term to describe silver bromide because it doesn't dissolve. Okay? So how would I measure the silver bromide? Why grams? Okay. Moles is the number of particles. Okay. One mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. If you started counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you would die well before you made it to the end of that counting process. Okay. So counting individual atoms isn't going to be a good idea because it's not just 1, 2, 3, 4. It's now finding there's 1, there's 2. Okay. 
you're not going to be able to enjoy the wealth of what you've gone through and made. Okay, so we don't want to count them. How can we measure that amount quickly? That's where we have mass. Why would we use mass and not volume? It's a solid. Okay? So I would use the mass term. Okay? That mass term I could then use to relate back to the money I could make. Useful. Okay? If we go back to our equation, remember, I want to plan out how much of that I'm going to make. Okay? To make silver bromide, I need aluminum bromide and silver nitrate. I have to have those pieces. Okay? How would I measure those starting pieces? Why are you saying volume now? Okay? If we look at the phase for those two species, they're aqueous. What does aqueous mean? Dissolved in water. Right? So if I went through and measured a volume, what is the volume I'm measuring? What am I counting for in that volume measurement? Is it just the aluminum bromide? No, what is it? If I give you 100 milliliters of aluminum bromide, okay, or aluminum bromide solution, that 100 milliliters corresponds to what species? If we have a solution of aluminum bromide, I forgot what I was writing, three, aqueous, that AQ means that this solution has water in it. When I measure out that volume, what's going to be in it? Water and aluminum bromide. Is water helpful to making silver bromide? Why not? It's not a part of the equation. It's not in the chemical equation. Water is useless. And yet, if I go to measure the volume, I'm measuring water's volume in it. That's not going to be helpful for me. If I went through and did mass, what's the problem with measuring the mass of that solution? I'm not getting just the aluminum bromide. I'm getting the aluminum bromide and water. Water, again, is not useful in this chemical reaction. It's not in there. It's only there to kind of mix these things. That's it. So if I start accounting for its mass or its volume or reporting those, I can't translate that through to the final product because that mass or volume includes the mass of water, which isn't doing anything useful. Right? So I need some way to separate water away from the aluminum bromide so I can understand exactly the potent thing that's in there. The aluminum bromide. Right? So it might be nice if I had a ratio. A ratio of what? Well, how about the aluminum bromide to the water? Okay, the analogy that I think we ran through at the end of last class, maybe, we talked about ABV. Yeah. Yeah, which was alcohol by volume. Okay. So it's the alcohol volume over the solution volume. Solution volume. Okay. Why did we pick volumes for both of those? Okay. Solution, it's, it's a solution by definition. It, it's, it's a liquid. What phase is an alcohol? Liquid. So I'm looking at a liquid, easiest to measure by volume, in a solution, easiest to measure by volume. It makes sense to do an alcohol by volume, volume to volume ratio. Okay. Is that an important thing to monitor, say, if you were going out on a weekend? Uh -huh. okay. Probably important because you walk out and they go, oh, well, that's only a four and a half ABV versus a 20 ABV. At least if you're over the age of 21. At least if you're over the age of 21. In the United States. We would need to be cognizant of that because if I drank two whatever units of the four and a half ABV versus two of the same volume of the 20 ABV, I'm going to have slightly different results. Okay. Depends on how you rank that. Okay. You're going to get 
massively different results. So I want to have some idea of the potent piece in the total solution, the alcohol over the solution. Same thing's coming back to chemistry. I want to know how much of the potent aspect, the silver bromide, is there in comparison to the carrying liquid. Right? What units could I use to describe that? Well, the ABV gives us a hint. We could use volume. I could say milliliters of aluminum bromide over milliliters of H2O, or liters of those. Right. Would I use that measurement? What's going to help me dictate that that's a good ratio to use? Why could we do ABV for alcohol? What phase was alcohol? A liquid. Why can I do liters for alcohol? Because it's a liquid. What phase is aluminum bromide? It's dissolved, okay? What was it before it was dissolved? I don't know. How would we figure that out? Periodic table would just give us aluminum, it'll just give us bromine. It's not going to give us aluminum bromide. So we could try to go to a chemical equation. But again, what, what I'm asking is I'm taking aluminum bromide and putting it into water. That relationship there says I have an aqueous solution. I'm trying to define what units that measurement should be. I'm already established that it's an aqueous solution by saying that I have this ratio. So how do I know what unit that should be? Liters? Or should it be meters? Why not meters? Meters is a distance. This is a substance. I'm not going to measure the distance of the substance. Okay. I want to measure kind of the amount. Liters would be a good option. Liters would be a good option if aluminum bromide was a liquid. You're now saying to use grams. Why use grams? When would you use grams? When it's a solid. When it's a solid. Well, which is it? It is. It is. Okay, we got confidence over here. Tell me, why do you know that's a solid? It says solid right there. It says solid next to silver bromide. This is aluminum bromide, so that one doesn't quite work. How would we figure that out? We could try and pull a solubility sheet. Wouldn't that be okay. to find out? Oh, yeah. And solubility sheet would actually work really well for this. The solubility sheet should actually tell us this. But what are we doing to figure that out? To figure out what phase it was? You're looking at a third party. You're looking at the actual compound. How could we find out information about an actual compound? I wonder if there was a depository of information where everybody compiles this so that we could then go through and look it up and find that information. Like the internet. Yes. Right. And if we use the internet, we will find that aluminum bromide is a solid. Right. So mass would make the most sense. Right. But now let's take a step back. We've looked it up. We know that grams makes the most sense for this. And yet... What unit am I introducing? Molarity. The moles of a substance in the liters of solution. Or I'm stating now grams per liters is where we should be going. Yeah, Mon, what do you got? Aluminum bromide by itself is a solid. When you add water, what happens? It becomes a solution. Right? Our whole point of this was to do what? Okay, and you're probably not going to answer my question, so ask yours. I was just saying, well, thinking, um, that... Uh, you lost it. <laughs> in an aqueous solution, there are, there are solid particles. Uh, yes. No. Okay. So you, you keep saying that solids, or even the, the sheet says that solids are insoluble. Mm -hmm. So then how can you now 
make a solid side wall? This is not the solid phase. What we have is some <laughs> solids are soluble or insoluble. In this case, we're specifying it's solid because we know that there's water in the solution. We're saying that that solid is insoluble in the water that's already present in the equation. When I look at just grams of aluminum bromide, am I saying anything about the presence of water? No. 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 So that was a funny <laughs> way to say no. I'm taking solid aluminum bromide, and what happens if I take that solid aluminum bromide and put it in water? It dissolves to become an aqueous solution, so which I can now use for the equation. Soluble, so yeah. Solids can be soluble, okay. Okay, which should not come as a surprise. Well, Table I'm, salt. Obviously, yeah. but the sheets always says like solids insoluble, insoluble. So that, that kind of confused me. So yeah, the solid that we're referencing is in a chemical equation, and the chemical equation always implies some other phase, okay. the presence of water. Yes. Okay. So I know that was now pushing 15 minutes ago. Why did I start this whole conversation about the aluminum bromide? What's a lot of money? Thank you. The silver bromide. I was trying to plan out how much silver bromide I could make. Okay. So let's just say that I know the solution. I can convert out the volume. I now know grams of aluminum bromide. Can the grams of aluminum bromide be used to directly convert into the grams of silver bromide? No. And you would know this because last week where I gave you a periodic table and told you to write down the important places on where to find conversion factors, you would look at and you would find that nowhere on that sheet does it say anything about the grams of a substance converting to the grams of another substance because that conversion factor does not exist. Like what sheet? That's why that sheet should be out in front of you. If you don't have that out in front of you, you're now going to miss an opportunity to be writing stuff that you should be memorizing for the first five minutes of the exam so you can purge it and have to not worry about it again. Okay? That's the point of that sheet. It's to help you remember that information for just long enough that you can then use it later on and not have to wait for that time to come through. Okay? So the grams of a substance to the grams of another substance does not exist. How do I convert substances? Through what unit? Chemical equations, chemical formulas. The chemical equation or the chemical formula. Can I convert aluminum bromide to silver bromide through a chemical formula? Why not? If I look at the chemical formula of aluminum bromide, why can I not convert that into silver bromide? I don't have silver in that chemical formula. Absolutely, the chemical formula doesn't work. So what do I need then? Silver. Okay, so I look at the chemical formula for silver bromide. Can I figure out how much aluminum bromide was needed to make that? No. No, because? So you need... Then, we would need aluminum. then you would need aluminum. So the chemical formula is useless on converting that substance. How do I convert that substance? Equation. Through the chemical equation. I now have a chemical equation. What unit is tied to the conversion through the chemical equation? That would be a substance. What is the unit in a chemical equation? Moles. So yes, this grams to liter thing, great. That is an awesome relationship. And yet, if I'm going to use a conversion process and convert this substance into something else, I have to go through a chemical equation. And the unit that goes through the chemical equation is moles. If I report this out as grams per liter, I'm going to have to do more conversions because my very first step is going to be to convert it into moles. So chemists said, I don't want to do that work. I'm going to create a unit that is now moles per liter because that shortcuts one of my conversion steps. That's why we use molarity. Okay. How come when we look at ABV, we aren't looking at moles per liter? Because 
substance? Ethanol is absolutely a substance, and so is the water that holds on to the alcohol. Is it because you're, when you're measuring the, the alcohol of the substance, you're measuring the alcohol of the substance and the alcohol? What are you doing with the ABV? What are you doing with that alcohol? Okay. What are we doing with the aluminum bromide? We're not selling the aluminum bromide. What were we selling? The, oh, the, the silver, silver bromide. bromide. What are we doing with the aluminum bromide? Making silver. Bromide. Making silver bromide. We're doing a conversion. We are converting aluminum bromide to silver bromide. Are we converting the ethanol? No. So I don't care about the unit of moles because when I'm drinking a beer, I'm not concerned about converting that alcohol into anything else. There's not another substance I'm looking at converting. So who cares what unit I use as long as I have a scale that I can look at? The scale that I can look at ends up being by volume. It's an easier system to look at. Chemists want to look at moles because that's how we convert between substances. That's the point of molarity. That is why it is there. Kind of, sort of? Okay. So, what is the molarity of a solution containing 24.0 grams of sodium hydroxide and 0.1 liters of solution? Okay, what do you think? Do you guys want to do this one together or the next one together? So we'll do this one together because that suggestion was already put out there. I want, what am I solving for? Molarity. molarity. What is my symbol for molarity? Capital M. Capital M. What am I given? 24.0 grams of I'm just going to underline it. 24.0 grams of sodium hydroxide, right? Am I given anything else? And 0 0.100 or 1 0 0.100 0 liters of solution. So I'm given two things. Which one goes in the numerator? Okay. This is the issue. Okay. In that shout out, we heard two answers. There were two choices. Guess what happens? Right? Half the class will do one, half the class will do the other, right? and more than likely the half that did the correct one will end up doing another 50-50 choice on the next conversion and screw that one up. Right? We need to have a reason behind why we place the things where we place them. Right? What does capital M mean? Molarity, M moles. Molarity which was moles over liters, okay? We got a substance for the liters of solution. What's the substance for the moles? What is the substance? 24.0 grams is not a substance. That is a numerical value and a different unit. What's that? Sodium hydroxide. Okay. Now if I go back to two pieces of given information, I have liters of solution. Does liters of solution better match my numerator or my denominator for my answer? Denominator. In fact, it directly matches my denominator. What does that mean, my liters of solution? Where should that numerical value show up? In the denominator. 0 0.100 liters of solution. What should show up in the numerator? So what the question says is 24.0 grams per 0 0.100 liters. Does it say per? No, it says in. Okay. So by putting that gram value on top, you're implying information. You're technically implying that information correctly. Okay. But I would be very leery of doing that. What should you place in the numerator? One, with no other unit. If you place anything other than one, this number is not 0.1 anymore. If you place in a different unit, you're, being, you're telling me 
that what you were given is not 0 0.100 liters, but 0 0.100 liters related to some other unit. Does that underlined in purple show another unit? No. So don't put another unit there. It just needs to be a one. This goes back to compartmentalizing each of those steps. Don't combine things. Just because it works once doesn't mean it works every single time. The whole idea is you're placing numbers in a numerator and a denominator. How many choices do you have? Two. I flip a quarter and it lands heads. I flip a quarter again. What's the next thing going to be? Heads or tails. It's a 50-50 shot. Okay. You guys are deciding where to place your numbers based off of a 50-50 shot. If you've got three things strung together, 50 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 is not passing the class. Okay? You need to have a reason behind why you place the numbers where you place them. That reason is not the numbers. That reason is the units. Look at your units. We now have a dilemma, though, with the next step. What is our dilemma? So since we're, we, we were given 24.0 grams, I want liters, moles of sodium hydroxide. I'm given grams of sodium hydroxide. I'm not given the same unit, but I'm given the same substance. Mm -hmm. okay? If we take a look, the substance sodium hydroxide is located where? In the numerator. The substance of solution is located where? Denominator. Where should I place the substance of sodium hydroxide? In the denominator? Okay, why no now? If I run my calculation now, my substance of solution would be located where? Numerator or denominator? Denominator. Is that where I want it to be? No. Liters? Solution? Yeah, it's exactly where it's supposed to be. Awesome. My substance, sodium hydroxide, is located on the left hand left left hand side of my equation. Where? On the bottom. Where is my substance, sodium hydroxide, in the answer? On the top. Did you place it in the correct location? No. Okay. So use the units that you're given or for your target to help you place. So I should place grams of sodium hydroxide on top. What should show up in the denominator? One. Why one? Because you don't want that number to change. Okay, I'm not trying to change the meaning of the given information, which was 24.0 grams of sodium hydroxide. <coughs> if I run the calculation as written, do I have my final answer? No, I would have grams per liter. Chemists say molarity, jerks, I have to convert to molarity. How do I convert that grams? What needs to happen to the unit of grams? Cancel. It needs to be canceled somehow. So grams of sodium hydroxide had better show up in the denominator in the next step so it can cancel. Why do I want moles of sodium hydroxide on top? Because when I look at my answer, where's moles of sodium hydroxide? In the top. On the top. Now, do I have a valid relationship between grams and moles? Yes, sir. Where's the relationship between grams and moles found? The conversion. Okay. Avogadro's number. Please look up Avogadro's number for me on the exam. For those of you being like, no, don't do that. Tough. You're doing it anyway. It's the one mole equals 6.022. One mole equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd items. Okay. Mole? Mole. Cool, I agree with you. Grams? Items. What is gram? Yes, it's a mass. Keep going. How do I obtain that mass? I have to measure it. Grams is a measurement. Items are a physical object. Okay? They aren't a measurement. They're an object. Are grams an 
objects the same thing then? No. So Avogadro's number, I'm fine with that. Cool, look at it. It doesn't match the unit system. You can't do it. Okay. So, not a useful conversion. Okay. There was a suggestion to look at the front of the exam. Cool, give me another one off the front of the exam. AMUs, 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24th grams. It's one AMU, right? Grams, grams, sweet. We got the grams, right? AMU, MOL. Those are not the same thing. That is why MOL does not sound like AMU when we read out the letters. They're not the same thing. <laughs> Demand a recount of what? Okay. What is an AMU? We'll come back to you, Braxton. Oh, Braxton. Thank you, Ahmad, but not yet. Atomic mass unit. Okay. What this is saying is that we have a mass unit, so the mass of something, that something being an atom. Whatever an AMU is, is a numerical value representing a mass unit for that atom. Okay. Is a mass unit moles? No. A mass unit is, again, a measurement. Moles is an object, a large number of objects. What is A? Atoms. atoms, which is an object. Great. The atoms ties, but then we have the MU part that didn't tie. Okay. So moles and AMU are not equivalent. There's no relationship. Uh, that's too far. I can't say that. There's not an easy relationship there. Let's just run with that. So AMUs to grams didn't work. Okay. Almost. Braxton, you were saying something. Braxton was first. No? Okay, Ahmad, what are you suggesting? Molar mass. Okay, molar mass. You mean if we use the uh let's not lexicon. Phonological. I don't know my words. The mole and the mass. If we use the components of the words, morphological, morpholo see, I was close. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's like in the words, yeah. Grams and moles in molar mass. Yes, that sounds like a phenomenal idea. That's exactly what we want. We want to use the molar mass. Where on the front of the exam is the molar mass? It's not on the front of the exam. It's on the periodic table. Okay. Which should also be in your notes where we said the molar mass is grams per mole. You now know that relationship. That's why it's written on the exam. That's why I told you to write that down. So that it's not this, I'm just going to start throwing things at it. Don't throw things at it. Find the units that match. So we go to the periodic table. What do we find out? Sodium is... 23, close enough. Oxygen is 16. Am I doing sodium hydroxide? Yeah. Hydrogen is 1, and we get a molar mass of 40. 40 what? 40 grams equals 1 mole. I could also get 40 AMUs equals 1 molecule. That is a valid interpretation. Do I want AMUs no. or molecules? No. no. So we can use the gram to mole relationship. The 40 needs to show up where? With the grams in our denominator. And now what happens? We would have our molarity. The units cancel out. Grams of sodium hydroxide cancel. I'd have moles of sodium hydroxide per liter of solution. Now I just have to enter it into the calculator. 24.0 divided by 0.1 divided by 40. Calculator spits out an answer. Everybody's happy. Okay. You, because you get the answer right. Me, because you got the answer right. 
and you get extra happy because you get a better grade on the exam. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. Prove it. This is one of the ones where all of that seems to make sense. And then Jeremy's got this 0 0.150 moles over liters thing, and Greg's got this capital M thing. And then he's like, well, I don't know what to do now in the next step. Well, the reason he doesn't know what to do is he's writing capital M. What is capital M? Molarity, Molarity which is what? As soon as you see that capital M of molarity, you should immediately be rewriting it as I've got rewritten in the upper right-hand corner. That unit system should now help you be able to process how to deal with the next step of the conversion. All right? So we'll see if Greg can go through and find us that on his own. All right? Just to put him on the spot, because why not? I apologize, Greg. I'm a horrible person. Um, while we go through and take a look at the rest of this. So, step one, what do we want for an answer? Grams of our potassium dichromate. It's okay if you don't know how to say that one for nomenclature's sake. Okay. Number two, what are we given? 125 milliliters and 0 0.150 moles potassium our molarity of potassium dichromate. So we now run to an issue, because we have two given pieces of information. Which one should we use? Okay. So again, coming up with a system on why we use those things is the important part behind this. Okay. Every number has a measurement associated with it. Every measurement also has the substance. What is our substance for 0.15 mole or unit for 0.15 molar potassium dichromate? Our measurements are moles and liters. What are the substances? Moles of potassium dichromate in liters of solution. I have that substance information tied to it. 125.0 milliliters. What's the substance? <coughs> Milliliters of what? Uh, something. something, I agree. Even better, it does begin with S. It's the solution. The potassium dichromate is a solid substance. Okay, if I'm measuring a volume, that needs to be of a solution. Why is this now helpful for us to figure out what we should start with? Okay. What am I ending with? Yeah, grams. Grams of elephants? Pineapples. Grams of That works. Grams of K2CR... Man, that is hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> the grams of our weird substance. Okay? The not solution. So I go back and look at the two pieces of given information. Which of those two pieces has the not solution? The one in purple very clearly says milliliters of solution. Is solution not solution? No. no, so that doesn't make sense to use that one. So let's take a look at the blue one. The blue one does have liters of solution in it, so it does have that substance, but it also carries the substance I want. Right? That can now help me go through and est establish my conversion. Grams of not solution. I want my not solution in the numerator, so I will go through and use my given information, the blue conversion factor, 0 0.150 moles K2Cr2O7 over 1 liter of solution. This gets me my substance in the correct place. It's not the correct measurement. I can work on that. Okay? It also introduces another measurement and substance that I don't want. So what do I want to work on? Getting moles into the proper unit or getting rid of the solution? 
getting rid of the solution. Okay, so to get rid of the solution, what would I need to multiply by? Or what would need to happen? Leaders of solution would need to show up in the numerator. Okay, am I given leaders of solution? No. What do you mean, kind of? I'm given milliliters, not leaders. So what does that mean the leaders is going to have to do? Convert. Be converted into? Milliliters. milliliters of solution. How do I convert that? Milli means 10 to the minus 3. Yes, that's a conversion factor I now have. My liters of solution now cancels. And I would have moles per milliliter of solution. Do I want milliliters of solution? No, so what do I need to do? Milliliters of solution needs to show up in the numerator in my next step. Am I given the milliliters of solution? Yeah. Excitement. That was too much excitement. What should show up in the denominator? Why one? I'm not trying to change the meaning of the given information. What happens? Milliliters of solutions cancel. The unit I would now have would be moles of potassium dichromate. Is that what I wanted for an answer? No, sir. So how do I fix that? Okay. I need moles in the denominator. I need grams in the numerator of my K2Cr2O7. I heard reference to molarity. What are the units of molarity? Moles over liters. This is grams over moles, not molarity. Where do I find grams over moles? Oh, sorry. That would be the molar mass. The molar mass would be found on the periodic table. That's our 294.2, assuming that you did it right, which I think is ballpark right. What happens? Your moles cancel. You'd be left with grams of potassium dichromate. It's now a question of entering it into the calculator. Does everybody track? Yeah. Right. The issue is if we go through and take a look at this, we take a look at what Jeremy had written up in blue. Did he do it the same order? No. Right? He picked something and went with it. Right? And it is fine to pick something and go with it. Realize that you have to make sure that you trust how you roll with it. Because it is very possible that you could place something in the numerator that needed to be placed in the denominator. Right? The only way you would find out is if you run through the calculation and you do not then start fudging your units to make something happen. You have to decide, is that conversion a valid conversion? Is it something I'm allowed to use? If you've got that, then you're good to run. Okay? So you have to trust where you find those conversion factors, and you have to trust the units associated with them. Okay? The process that I outlined here is arguably different than how I would have done it in the past. I would have done it exactly how Jeremy did it. Okay? This process shows you the substances. It helps you place where things need to go. Use your units to help you solve the question. If you leave any aspect of the unit off, the number, the measurement, or the substance, you're now just guessing, and if you're lucky, you guessed right. Freely admit, I have guessed a lot more than I care to admit in my past. Okay? Understand where and why you're moving through it. Okay? With that said, go ahead and read this question for me. That's not a question. Let's not start that fight. <laughs> What is capital M? Molarity. That is our moles per liter. You're responsible for knowing that chemistry content. That's not a bad idea to write down as soon as you get your exam. You know what capital M means. It's going to show up as capital M. 
right? If we look at this question, what are you being asked to solve for? The molarity of a substance, nitric acid. You're given the, the volume of the nitric acid, which could work for molarity. Are you given the moles of the nitric acid? No. What other information are you given? The molarity of barium hydroxide. Is that a different substance? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. More than likely, what are you being asked to do? Convert, convert substances. How do we convert substances? Chemical Through a chemical equation. What are we probably going to need to solve this? A chemical, a chemical equation. equation. What this question has embedded in it is everything we've talked about for the last probably five, six weeks that you have to go through and process and pull that information out, synthesize it, and put it all back together. It is a giant, big question. Okay. Where's the, the he, he, he coming from? Right. In the past, what we decided to do was to make this extra credit, and what I wanted was you to de develop a process to solve this question. Okay. Okay. Just so you know, I've offered this as extra credit in three different sections, and across those three different sections, running usually at 48 per section, I have not had a single team turn in a process that was valid. That's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yay. Not yet. Okay. Challenge. Which is one of the reasons... <laughs> why we've decided to not offer this as extra credit, but I am addressing it because this kind of a question is something that you're responsible for being able to do. Okay? It is a great cumulative question because it brings in everything that you're supposed to know. Okay? But it is insanely difficult because of all of those interlocking pieces that have to be put together correctly. So how might this get presented if not in an extra credit for you to take home? Probably on the test as an extra credit question. Well, it's an extra credit. Extra credit. Except, I would never expect you to show beginning to end all the work for this because that's a lot of work behind it. Okay? So, for an exam, that is a highly likely question to show up as an extra credit question. There's lots of pieces behind it, there's lots of opportunity to make mistakes, there's lots of opportunity to make, get things right so there'd be a sizable portion of extra credit found in that question. Okay? I am not going to walk through it. If you would like to find that question again, that's what the slides are for. Chapter 10, our gases. Okay? We've talked briefly about gases in the past. We're now going to get a little bit more in depth. This is just some really kind of boring summary stuff, so it's not that big a deal. Variable shape and volume. You guys are probably familiar with all of that um, from your readings. Okay? And then that was poorly timed, so let's ignore that and that and that and move to our ideal gas behavior. So when we talk about monitoring or interacting with different phases, we come up with measuring mass, looking at moles. We had molarity to represent solutions. We're going to have a similar concept come up with gases. Gases have the potential to act in bizarre systems or bizarre ways. So what we want to go through and do is simplify what we're looking at so that we can make quick approximations that are roughly accurate. These are the approximations that come into looking at an ideal gas. Okay? So the first one... All of our gas particles are so tiny that they have no volume. So this means when I put a bunch of gas into a container, every one of those gas particles has access to the entire container. So the volume does not change with the amount of gas I put into it. Does that make physical sense to you? Does it make sense that our particles have no volume? We take a look at this room and make us a gas particle. Okay, this room has a volume to it, right? Okay. When I walk into the room, I have anywhere I can be. I have access to the entire volume of the room. The next person walks in. Do they have access to the same volume? No. 
Right? Why are you saying no? I'm taking up volume. My physical presence prevents you from existing where I exist. Right? Even if you knock me out, I'm still physically there. You still can't exist in my space. Right? For gases, we can make the assumption that we as people can exist anywhere in this room. And the reason we can make that assumption has to come back to our properties of gases. Very, very low densities, the odds that any two particles would ever try to even attempt to exist at the same time or same place is very low. Okay, so we make that approximation. That simplifies our calculations a lot. Okay? After that, gases will move in rapid motion, straight lines. Uh, they have no attraction for one another. That's another one I usually like to talk about. Does that really make sense? Okay. When you walk in and see other people, you're like, yep, zero attraction for anybody else. Pretty much, you don't have any friends. You don't have anybody, you're like, damn, that, I'm going to run him over the next time I see him on a bicycle. Okay. Hopefully you don't have anybody like that. Okay. We have attractions, be them positive or negative, to other particles. We make the assumption that gases have no attraction for one another. Okay. If we don't make that assumption, things get nasty in our calculations. Right. When they do collide, on the off chance they get near enough each other to collide, they will collide without losing energy. Similar to, say, pool. You have two pool balls bouncing along, they impact each other, and for the most part, they ricochet off without losing that energy, which kind of goes back to physics, yes. The last one, kinetic energy of the gas molecules is proportional to temperature. What is kinetic energy a measure of? Kinetic energy. What is kinetic energy a measure of? Movement. Okay. So if I increase the temperature, what am I saying? I increase movement. Okay. So temperature and kinetic energy are directly related to each other. Okay. If I make all of those assumptions, then this thing in this box becomes true, which it looked to me like some people actually read about, back in chapter 8, and I told you to not read about it because I think it is incredibly stupid, and we're going to address that stupidity here in just a second. One mole of any gas equals 22.4 liters. Right, what are we relating? What two units? Moles and liters. Did we just talk about a unit system that related moles and liters? What was that? The molarity. This is saying that it's always 22.4 liters, though. Did molarity say that? Why not? Molarity is not right. This is right. So is molarity right. Molarity applies to solutions. This applies to gases. You change the phase, it's an entirely different conversion system, so you have to be careful within that. So that's the biggest statement that comes out of this. When we move to gases, we have a new mole to liter relationship, and it works only for gases. If you're in a solution, do not use this conversion factor. It doesn't work. Okay? So, it's a conditional conversion factor. Okay? But it is kind of nice, because in the case of molarity, we could make, change the amount of moles in that volume. Here, do we change the moles? No, because it says very specifically, one mole is 22.4 liters. Okay? It is defined for us. It's a constant. It doesn't change, assuming all of the assumptions were made above. Okay? So that's kind of neat. We could just memorize that relationship, and any time I was working with a gas, I can do this nice, quick, and easy conversion between volume and moles. Okay? But not at any time. We've seen things pop up before within parentheses. What did those parentheses typically signal? Phase changes, yeah. Where else have we seen parentheses? When there's exceptions. Okay. This statement is true when at STP. 
What is STP? Standard, temperature, and pressure. Okay? Because temperature and pressure affect gases. So as long as we're at a standard temperature and pressure, this statement is true. Okay? What is standard temperature? Room temperature would make a lot of sense because we're trying to look at observations that we would make in reality and we would expect room temperature to be consistent. But the room temperature here in Arizona versus the room temperature in San Diego versus the room temperature in Denmark versus the room temperature in South America. It's not all the same. It's not standard. It's not all the same. So that doesn't work as a room temperature. So what do we decide is our standard temperature? <laughs> Okay, we pick an arbitrary value of zero degrees Celsius. Okay, why is zero degrees Celsius kind of a weird number to pick? It's cold. We would never be at zero degrees Celsius. You be, imagine being in a lab. You guys are complaining about how cold our labs are at like 19. If yeah, they're probably 19 degrees Celsius, guys. They aren't that cold. Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Christmas. If we drop that down to zero degrees Celsius, okay, we would be pretty much non-functional for extended periods of time. Why did we pick zero degrees Celsius? It's easy to convert between Celsius and Kelvin. That's why we pick zero degrees Celsius. But it's standard. If it's standard, what does that mean? Everywhere, standard temperature, zero degrees Celsius. Unless you're an engineer. Unless you're a physicist. Unless you're an electrical engineer. Unless you're a civil engineer. Unless you're a biochemist. Unless you're a general chemist. Standard temperature is not consistent. It all depends on whoever the hell you are and whatever you've decided is standard temperature. Which is insanely frustrating. Okay? More so because then what happens? Is this expression valid anymore? No. no. We're telling you to memorize an expression that is generally not true and then generally not accepted as a valid conversion factor across the world. And yet you're told to memorize it. Ooh. Why? <laughs> because it's a conversion factor that we expect you to go through and use. Good job, guys. Okay. So you are expected to go through and have this conversion factor and use it. The only time you will ever use this conversion factor is in a lecture class. It makes no sense to use that relationship anywhere else at any other time. Unless you're at zero degrees Celsius and standard pressure. We just addressed the issue with standard temperature that it's not standard. What's standard pressure? One atmosphere. Thankfully, that one doesn't change. However, when are we at 1 ATM? Sea level. How often are we at sea level? Okay. We're slightly off sea level. Okay. Which means the pressure is not consistent. It is not easy to change our environment to make sure that that pressure is matched. So this conversion factor I find insanely frustrating because you're being asked to memorize it to use it only for the sake of a, a test. But yes, that is exactly what you are expected to do. Yes. Okay. So, as we continue through, let's go ahead and use it. How many liters are needed to hold two grams of hydrogen gas? What are we being asked to solve for? Liters, this one gets a little bit weird. There's not a solution, so it's, it's going to end up being the same substance. It'll be liters of our hydrogen. What are we given to start with? Okay. Why am I writing H2 for hydrogen gas? That is the symbol for hydrogen gas. Do you need to know that? Yes. yes. Is that going to be relevant for solving this question? Yes. Quite likely. Step two, grams of H2 needs to disappear. What do I want? I want liters of H2. Okay. For those of you writing in pen, stop writing in pen. Just pause. Let's think about this. 
right? Do I have a conversion factor between grams and liters? No. So what do I want to convert my grams to? Milligrams? No. I could go into milligrams. Moles of H2 is the only one that's going to be the most useful. Remember, your standard move for all our conversions, convert to moles. Do it. Where do I find the conversion factor between grams and moles? That goes to our periodic table. 2.01, one mole. I'm getting the feeling you guys think this is excessively easy. So we'll just do that. We'll do that. Liters, 22.4 liters is one mole. And we'll move on. No one's paying attention, so we're moving on. Atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is how we monitor the individual pressure of a system. We'll do that using a manometer. Within our manometer, what's happening? We trap liquid inside a tube. We trap liquid inside an open container. I flip the tube upside down in the liquid. What happens? The liquid's going to fall out. Why will the liquid fall out of this? Gravity. Gravity is going to push it down. Yet, for some reason, it seems to hover. Why does it hover? Because of the atmosphere. Something has to be pushing up. What's pushing up? The molecules. The molecules in the solution down here are pushing up. Why are they pushing up? Because atmospheric pressure is pushing down on the liquid. That's what keeps it in there. If we're looking at pressure systems, our units behind pressure all go back to this. I'm measuring the height of a column of liquid. How do I measure height? Inches, millimeters, meters, centimeters. I can measure my pressure in units of those systems. What is the height of that tube? That gets me a pressure system. What does that then mean? You're responsible for then converting between each of those unit systems. Yippee. Okay. With that, we'll go ahead and end. And we'll see how far we get on Thursday.